We, uh, the next session is about packaging compliance. We've heard so much about different aspects of uh, packaging safety, but now we want to know how to, as Mr. Kandab Singh said earlier, connect, integrating packaging safety. So we want, we've kept a session on connecting the dots, where, where we are going to uh, look at how uh, different aspects of packaging can be made safer. For this session, I want to invite uh, Dr. Evert on the stage again. Uh, he'll be the session chairman. And uh, uh, Mr. J.B. Miller, Product Development Manager at IMEA uh, at Henkel, a chemical engineer with a specialization in product development from uh, School Chemistry de Leon. Miller has over 10 years of experience in product development for industrial adhesives within diverse Henkel businesses in Europe. His primary focus has been on hot melt adhesive for various industries, from end of line packaging to tapes and labels. He is currently leading the product development activities for the packaging and consumer goods adhesives business of Henkel in India, Middle East, and Africa region. Along with him, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Peter again. And uh, Mr. S. N. Venkatraman, better known as Venki, who is the Divisional Head Marketing, Paper Board and Speciality Division, ITC. Venki is fondly, as Venkatraman is fondly called, has a career spanning 25 years with ITC's Paper Board and Speciality Papers Division in Sales and Marketing. He has worked in Field Sales, Key Account Manager, International Sales, as the head of domestic sales. During this period in ITC PSPD, he has steadily expanded the business and is today a dominant player in packaging and graphic paper boards, recycled board segments, and uh, communication papers. He's, it's, uh, he initiated the membership of ITC in WWF GFTN India which brings together business and other stakeholders interested in sustainable forestry development. He and his team have worked closely with FMCG Pharma, food, other packaging goods companies in meeting brand packaging requirements by bringing world-class products to the Indian market and propelling ITC into a leadership position. He's also on the CII Telangana pan panel as convener and with IIP Hyderabad. So now I hand over the session uh, to... Uh, Ah, we have one more uh, panelist here, Mr. Raghu Guda. Mr. Raghu Guda? Raghu? Yeah. He is the uh, director, Ernst & Young, India. He is a bachelor in electrical and electronics engineering and an MBA from Queen's University, Canada. Raghu has 23 years of professional experience, primarily in energy, government, food and beverages regulatory compliance sectors. His entrepreneurial experience includes leading a firm offering consultancy, advisory and IT services in the area of regulatory compliance services for FMCG products. He has aided in developing regulatory compliance strategies for all food, drug and cosmetic products in online marketplace, across vendor, product and supply chain aspect and is an active participant in roles of speaker moderator on various F&B seminars and workshops. So uh, we had 90 minutes for this seminar, for this session. If I may I request all of you to try and condense it as much as possible so that we get back a little bit on time. So thank you, over to you. So thank you very much. The session uh, has been perfectly introduced. Um, we uh, just discussed uh, the order of the speakers because uh, some of us have a flight which uh, they need to take and uh, for that reason we changed the order that way that uh, Wenki will start, then um, JB will continue and then it's uh, Jörg and uh, finally it's Mr. Gouda. Yeah? Hope, I hope that's okay for you. So. Uh, let's uh, do not uh, lose uh, additional time and uh, I kindly ask um, 
Venki to uh, speak about packaging compliance, connecting the dots, so the floor is yours. Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Evert, and thank you, Deepak, for the introduction. It's always good to be back here in uh, Delhi. Uh, this is a great setting. I think we had a fantastic set of speakers, and thanks to Seagwork and Pratik Day and Ashish for organizing this. Good to get in touch with all of you again. Paper and paper boards are always a poor cousin as far as packaging materials are concerned, especially where food packaging is concerned, you know. So we talk a lot about flexible plastics, all the developments in polymers, all the additives, solvents and all the things which you spoke about. But paper and pa paper board remain kind of hidden in the entire uh, uh, packaging material scene. So we had sessions earlier and a lot of questions. So I think that will make the job of the speakers a bit easier in the last session. So let me dive into the topic. All of you may not be able to see it, so I may just uh, read it out. So these are the topical issues and this is from a forum where I'm a member. So. The first one says, recall of Dutch waffles, highly contaminated with mineral oils. So all of you spoke about it, many of you uh, <coughs> mentioned about it. So again, MOH, MOS at levels at 190 ppm, so Belgium and Netherlands have decided to recall some of the waffles. Heavy metals came in, antimony in food packaging. So they are finding it in food trays, straws and single-use drink bottles and as a catalyst in uh, PET. Disposable plastic items banned in Delhi, so out on country, so that's happened uh, for some time. So cutlery bags, cups and other plastic items are banned by the National Green Tribunal. So regulations are not only about materials, regulations are not only about the uh, migration, it's also coming from tribunals and others. So, you know, waste recycling, use of such material comes under National Green Tribunal, so that's impacting us. In Taiwan, so you make new materials, I don't know, you put it in your rings, you could put it in a paper, you may put it in films, so nanomaterials. So people talk about nanomaterials. So any new material that you introduce in an existing packaging substrate, is going to have some kind of impact and you have to do the risk assessment before you do it. So standards are yet to catch up with introduction of nanomaterials and they may pose a risk, although they also give a lot of functional and other kind of benefits, both in food as well as in uh, food packaging. Okay, so there's something on talates and there's something on contaminants. So that's the scene around us. This, of course, is the most popular paper packaging in India. <laughs> okay. So when you say paper packaging, we are not so much in primary packaging, we are mostly in secondary packaging and that's the real reason why paper and paperboard doesn't draw so much attention. But reused newspaper, recycled newspaper, the most popular paper packaging in India and recently you have a regulation. So FSSIL formed some guidelines and I think one of the previous speakers spoke about you can have your regulations but somebody has to enforce it so now it goes to the municipalities and then the tire one towns up to panchayat as to what they do. But I think Maharashtra, which has had a Food and Drug Administration for some time, has started pilot programs in Bombay and in Pune, for example, where they are actually monitoring the usage of uh, newsprint for storing loose food or to, dispo, uh, to cater to lo uh, loose food and uh, insisting that some food grade paper be used. Okay, so lead is present in the inks, migrates into food, so poor barrier against water, oil, grease, so all that we know from the previous sessions. So this is where we are in India and of course everybody is not at the standard of living as in the West. So packaging regulations here cannot be, I mean it has to catch up with the West. We know that we have material based regulations but we really don't have an overall system based regulation and that's what I think FSSI will kind of bring into the country. Maybe borrow from others, evolve itself on its own and you will have a probably hybrid Indian model as we always fondly seem to want one. So paper and board, what matters? So, food contact, the direct and indirect, as I told you, the direct usages of paper and both for food packaging, olden time, butter parchment paper, even today continues, for example, with Amul. Otherwise, a lot of paper and board is for indirect food packaging. 
But in the case of paper cups, it's a direct package. Of course, there's a barrier material. In the case of a liquid packaging, aseptic uh, uh, kind of material, so tetra brick or something like that. Again, it's slightly indirect, but in very close contact with the food that is being f uh, filled. So a lot of functional parameters and a lot of aspects about food safety which come in. So when you talk about food contact, there's direct and indirect. And from there, you know, the differentiation starts. So what is the level of purity that's there in the paper? So I will cover some of these things in the subsequent slide too. So what are the inputs that you can use when it's for direct contact and it's for indirect contact? I think that's an aspect that will come in. Migration tests have been very well covered, number of solvents, especially by uh, Dilip Singh from uh, SGS, so I'll not go through it again. So migration tests are important both for direct and indirect contact. We always use regulations from outside, either the BGVV, the BFR German regulation, or the FDA regulation of the US, which is very popular in India. And in fact, that's the main regulation which is used to show that paper or paper board is actually suitable for food packaging. Of course, the inputs, uh, okay, before that, so in our production process, for example, so in India, there are still mills which use chlorine for bleaching, although they're getting phased out in a couple of years when you use paper or paper board. So if you use chlorine for bleaching, you're going to produce some chloro compounds, which are called the dioxins and furans, which you heard before, earlier in the sessions. And they are part of the packaging material and they are also something which get discharged into the water. So both are not acceptable and there are standards with respect to that. As part of the packaging material, they may fail some migration kind of test and get into. So the previous packaging sessions, if you saw, almost scares you as a consumer. There are so many things to bother about. I don't know whether anyone of us will ever buy another package and eat from it. Because there are so many standards to comply and so many new things which are coming in. So dioxins and furans are part of that uh, entire uh, atmosphere. And when you do chlorine bleaching, you have that. So if you go to elemental chlorine free bleaching, for example, I'm relating connecting the dot to paper and paper board, then you don't produce that to the same degree or you almost eliminate them. So a uh, change in the back-end manufacturing technology can actually make your uh, packaging material more food contact under regulations like FDA, BGVV. So that's an example, the so talates, microbial content. So paper is made with water and then you press and dry and remove the water and the water is recirculated, there's going to be a lot of microbial activity in the entire system, but a food grade paper which goes in the market cannot have that. So that has to be kind of monitored. So you have to use biocides, for example, in your process to do that. So what kind of biocide you're using to what uh, chemistry does it uh, belong to and how are you going to control it actually matters. So that is the science behind paper making and making it food grade. It's not just about getting, give me a food grade board with a certificate. Because most people about paper and paper board, unlike polymeric films, only know about a food grade board and an FDA kind of certificate which passes the test. Okay, so there is a science which is evolving, not yet to the same level. So part of this session is about building that awareness and sharing with you. So when you use paper and paper board, all the inputs of course have to confirm. So the BGVB would have some permitted list and a non-permitted list, so would the FDA, so would tomorrow maybe many Indian standards. And you have to kind of confirm to that because there are things that are changing in the background. So when I touch on optical brightening agents, for example, you'll understand that the chemistry is changing from sulfur-based OBAs to a different kind of OBA. So you can have OBAs with foot contact, which are not allowed earlier. But in general, for foot contact papers and boards, people say that you should not use optical brightening agents. Okay, so in direct contact especially. For indirect contact, it's all right. Now paper and board goes through a printing process, it's converted. I mean, other materials may get laminated onto it. Of course, it's made into a blank and then shaped into a carton. So that entire process, which has been covered very well in the earlier sessions. So you print, uh, printing ink. So typically in a product pack, especially if you did a food packaging, people would measure for a chocolate, for example, order levels. So you have a test for the paper, paper board, but it goes through further printing and you're printing it through inks. So one of the things that they measure is hexanol and nonanol aldehyde content, for example, from the uh, paper board. So it could come from the paper or board, if you're not careful. It could also come from the further downstream processes through inks or solvents or whatever you use. So these things have to be kind of controlled. Then of course you go through processing, filling process, distribution and final consumption. So all that matters. So temperature, humidity, so the ovenable and non-ovenable board. So what would you use for an ovenable board? Because ovenable can be conventional oven, it can be in microwave oven, so there's a reheat temperature. What kind of board would you use? What kind of furnace you would use? What kind of binder is there in the paper? What kind of binder is there? The ink and adhesive, for example, to make it all matter when you are talking about a package which is food safe from the viewpoint of a consumer. So it's based on the brand owner, it's based on the consumer, it also flows back from the packaging material through the conversion process. And of course public health regulations, which as we know from the earlier slide, that every day there is something which is coming. I mean, the 
the first few news items which I gave you are all just between March and June from a food packaging forum. So how do you choose the most uh, appropriate packaging? Okay, that is protection. Okay, regulatory would mean, I mean, these have been covered, so benzoprene free, anthraquinone free, for example. Where does anthraquinone come in? Some people may use it to improve their pulp yields. <coughs> and there may be residuals, for example, in the paper or packaging. So you have to control that limit of anthraquinone. Mineral oil migration, well covered, so extractables and reachables, the previous speakers are covered. I'll not dwell on it. The kind of mother legislation which covers a paper is the EC guideline, I think it's 1935-2004. That gave the directive for the paper business. Till then, most of the information, data and the guidelines that are available were essentially available for flexible packaging or even for metal tin based kind of packaging. So after 1935, EC 1935 to 2004, you know, individual countries have framed their own regulations. Germany has its BGVV and BFR and, of course, FDA. So many of you in the business would ask, what is the difference between FDA and BGVV? So FDA focuses a lot on migration limits as a means of ensuring safety in food packaging, apart from a list of permitted inputs, and it makes a difference between direct and indirect contact. BGVV does the same, but BGVV also recommends a lot of good manufacturing practices in its uh, standards. So it's a bit more overarching than the FDA. So people could follow standards. So if you're an American company, you would probably ask for the FDA. India mostly is FDA oriented, but when you export to the EC, for example, or to the continent, the BGVV or BFR regulations become uh, very important. So what has happened in paper or paper boards? So at the bottom, you see recycled uh, fiber boards going to virgin fiber boards, then virgin fiber boards, which are OBA free and with permitted inputs. And then at the next level, virgin fiber board is some kind of barrier, like we have the poly extrusion barrier on our boards which make it suitable for frozen packaging. And some people talked about it. So we also have developed a board, for example, with a PLA coating. So it is compostable and true. So as a paper company or when you buy a paper or board, we can actually give you something which is entirely from material which is renewable and which fixes carbon. So I think people spoke about spiritualism, linking it to bigger speaker, I mean, big, big, bigger uh, ideas. So you can actually fix carbon when you use the paper, if it comes from plantations where you actually measure the amount of carbon being fixed. And if you use a biopolymer, which is totally extracted from either waste, plant, plant waste, or it's extracted from, uh, let's say, sugar or starch or something like that, which is what polylactic acid is about, even that helps to fix. Okay, so that's the highest level. Of course, uh, co functionality and cost do matter. It's not yet reached and that's a rapidly growing field. A lot of research going on into newer types of biopolymers. So ultimately, I think a lot of food waste or a plant waste actually could go into making biopolymers which give something. But for that, there has to be a kind of enabling legislation in the country. Only an en enabling legislation or regulation will provide the framework where people actually are incentivized to use such packaging so that there is less litter. Because materials can be recycled, so a lot of plastic packaging, the difficulties in recycling. So is plastics good or bad? I mean, no material is good or bad per se. And plastics is absolutely essential for, you know, reaching out to the masses. So the difficulties in collection and in recycling. So now, for example, in India, we put it into highways and we have found out ways to kind of recycle the plastic. But collection is still a big headache. So with paper, you have less such headache, but paper doesn't have barrier, and you have to graft a barrier on paper, and that way it becomes more suitable for packaging applications. So what are the types of coatings? So conventionally, the LDP or the polyolefin coatings are there. So you, you see it in your paper cups, beverage cups. It's a very fast-growing market in India. Ice cream cartons and uh, tubs, for example, and the fast food carton tub. Still growing in India, but these are all examples of direct contact, actually, with a paper, paper board with a thin sliver of a barrier material. Biodegradable coatings, so which I already spoke about. At the next level, I think there are new dispersions also which are coming. And these dispersions, for example, instead of being a downstream process, if they can be done on the main machine itself in the board or part of the board, I think they will provide for better cost and with equal functionality. So those are areas actually that we are working on. And uh, among the things, for example, you see below that you used to get grease resistance by fluorochemical based uh, polymers. Now, fluorochemical based polymers are a no-no in EC and USA. Japan, I think, still allows use of fluorochemical uh, based uh, polymers for grease resistance. So you need alternatives to such fluorochemical based polymers because, again, halogen, atmosphere, so all that is uh, still there, so hasten uh, climatic change. The same thing with refrigerators. You don't use halon gases or you want to use the 
the non uh, halogenic gases in order to you know it's part of climate change and protecting the same this has been covered i'll just rush through it so i mean we just made a timeline of the various packaging regulations so if you see starting from 1950s fda came with the food drug and cosmetic act it went to a labeling act weights and measures tylenol issues and uh, in between you had also environmental regulations coming in fsc for example food labeling life cycle assessment food standards act by 1999 then a bit of climate change and carbon disclosure then brc so that is something any manufacturer can follow a lot of converters already follow that but brc is the is a good manufacturing standard actually which can also be applied for paper and paperboard making we are among the few to actually have both our barrier plant which does the polyolefin coating as well as some of our main machines at badrachalam to brc so if you are a printer or if you are an end user you would, you could uh, understand the dimensions of this you know a carton conversion plant maybe of some 20 30000 square meters it's housed you can pressurize it and do that to do it in a paper machine which is often 300 meters long and the building is about 15 meters wide to accommodate a de decal of 4 meters for example on the machine is a humongous task but because we supply food packaging boards and liquid packaging boards we have gone in for this so the brc regulations are in part two parts for example so bolaram can give direct contact and badrachalam actually is suitable for indirect uh, contact and of course we now came with fssai so as the speaker in the earlier session mentioned from fssai ms anil kumar we don't have enough on it with respect to the packaging and labeling standards maybe a lot on labeling but not yet enough on packaging if you go through the entire fssai directives and what they release there's hardly very little on essential uh, packaging so that is a lacuna in india so that has to be kind of addressed going forward so what are the main regulations i did cover 1935 uh, 2004 FDA which is CFR 21 176 170 that is for uh, direct contact 180 is for indirect contact the BGBB 36 as they say which is the german recommendation china is now a big player in the paper and packaging market so their standard also is kind of relevant especially if you are doing exports of products to china so some of them may differ in their migration and other limits otherwise most of these standards mirror each other with some country specific standard For example, when we exported board to Korea, we found that the Korean standard for migration with acetic acid as a stimulant was something which was far more stricter than what FDA specified, because the Koreans take eat a lot of takeaways and uh, food, a lot of wet food also, which may have where the stimulant used to stimulate was acetic acid. So their standards are a bit more superior actually to FDA or BGVB. So it all goes by country, the food habits, and what the the national standards authority has done we don't yet have one and with through fssi i hope something comes in this also has been covered in a general way so there is a reach chemical so these are all part of declarations when you make exports of packaging either the blanks or the final product so apart from environmental declarations you have to make packaging declarations especially where it's a food product so you have to see that the chemicals used are all permitted okay and the listing has to be there they have to refer a certain number and follow a certain direction the brc standard for packaging materials and then of course india's own uh, fssi standard this question comes often i mean what is the difference between recycled and virgin boards can you use one for the other so india was mainly till 20 25 years back uh, a recycled board country and uh, till we came in with the first uh, virgin board so in essence you can make batches in recycled board which are food contact whether you'll be able to do continuously in your production is really the challenge so if you use only what is called printer waste or pre consumer waste which has not gone and collected from household or from a municipal waste lot in theory it's possible to probably make a recycled board or a, re a recycled paper which can be food contact in practice is next to impossible because it's not a manufactured material it's a material which you collect from various sources and there will be contamination and uh, other uh, things which happen there and therefore it's not suited for any direct contact indirect contact also less suited because you can't maintain the standards and for example your level of microbial activity and things like that will far higher there it may be foul smelling you can't maintain your standards you can't maintain your aesthetics and it's highly risky so in theory something may be possible in practice it is not and therefore recycle boards are not really recommended anywhere where there is direct food contact and there are a lot of new print and recycle board so i don't know what your experience is but uh, when you use new print new print comes from a earlier stage of pulp compared to chemical bleaching so some of it can contribute sometimes to that mo mo ah and mo sh so that's become a bit of an issue so we actually have an example like that and it's out of some customer in delhi i won't name him uh you would all understand that better so for christmas 
you have a lot of packaging in various shapes in which chocolates are kept, right? So that order came to somebody in India and he used our board. Now MOH, MOSH still doesn't have standard European or regulations. Only the Swiss have bounced a lot about it. The Germans are yet to fully accept it. Everybody is doing studies in the market and seeing what it is. But between the time we got the order and between the time my customer shipped, some new regulation came in Germany or the customer in this case, or the German retail customer who supplies into the Christmas market, he measured, he had approved a board earlier through the printer. He measured and said these levels are dangerously high and now the Swiss have put new regulations. So I can't take the consignment. So there are such threats now. So although some of them are not regulations, customers can very often not want to use, fearing that there is an impending regulation. So actually the printer had to call back the kind of uh, shipment. So it happened out of a printer here. So that's how things are changing. So virgin boards, of course, there's purity, so it's from pulp, consistent quality, stiffness and all those factors, virgin fibers. So important thing here is your foot contact or safety is not decided on the basis of one lab report of SGS or anybody which you submit. It is the system behind it and whether you have actually a good manufacturing practice in your mill. So that Larger converters, larger end users have teams which check that. The smaller guys don't have that. So anybody can produce an FDA certificate today because the lab which does the test would say that I'm right. This particular sample, even if it's having recycled content, meets the migration limit. So if that is the only thing you're going to look for and not look at all the other legislations which matter, then you would say that uh, that's foot contact. So that's a false claim and a wrong claim and a dangerous claim to make. So these are the various types of paperboard uh, paper usages, for example, and food packaging. Tobleron, for example, entire stuff depends on food packaging. It's a confectionery, so smell and other controls like that are extremely important. A lot of liquor, not really a food, but you can say a lot of it is on board and metalized uh, film laminated board. Biscuits, for example, are coming back into the carton space. Paper cups. So paper cups, again, there are some people, for example, in a country, pulp is costly, so you would have the tendency to get white waste and put it in. Is it safe or not? It may meet, some samples of it may meet the food mi uh, the migration limits. But when you take a paper cup and actually drink, your lip is pressing against the paper and it may have recycled content. So you don't know whether it's really safe or not. So we do again don't have standards in all these areas. So paper and paperboard, slightly the neglected uh, cousin you can say as far as the packaging materials are concerned, more awareness is needed and a system of regulations which protects the consumer and brings in some standards. So more and more ice cream cartons, trays. So the direct food contact is really for all your disposable food packaging as we say, which is for your beverage cups and also for your KFC burgers and all the wraps that you see. <coughs> so parchment could go into a kind of treated paper in the future. Glassine paper can be used for packaging. So we are also now experimenting with coatings on our lightweight papers which can uh, replace, for example, parchment and other kind of processes which are very slow, costly and old machinery. So how do we ensure that? We use only approved chemicals, OBAs, for, uh, so we, for the chemistry of OBAs are changing from sulfur-based to urea-based to better uh, properties. Neutralization of microbial activity, as I mentioned before. Somebody else talked about machinery can also have a role. So we have one customer in India, so in connecting the dot, we had Siegberg, yeah, Tetra Pak inaugurate, uh, Mr. Kandar Singh inaugurate the conference. We are a large board supplier to Tetra Pak in India. And now they don't, they want food grade lubricants to be used on all the machinery. So that's connecting the dot all across. So they said, even if there's accidental spillage or takeover, they want the lubricant which is used in the machinery to actually be food grade. That's one of the latest requests which have come. So there are a lot of monitoring of regulations and advisories which keep coming in this field. So. It, the bigger the company, the stronger the brand, the more global they are, the more requirements they are to be met. So what else do we do in our process? So from beginning, we have magnetic separators so that metal and iron content can be separated. The bleaching process that we follow, so there is no chlorine, you only see ClO2 which is chlorine dioxide and after that ozone bleaching. So the chloro compounds, organochloro compounds are not formed, so less than one part per trillion of dioxins and furans. There is a process called hot dispersion, so it kind of, again, steam, in a screw, so you eliminate all the impurities, separate all the impurities, and it can then be removed by centric cleaners. Elimination of ammonia and the coating colors, again, a good manufacturing practice like BRC, and product traceability. Somehow that didn't come through, but you should have a good traceability standard here. Otherwise, you cannot be in the food packaging business. 
what else do we do? So we can do tests, we can guarantee to you the bacterial count in a paper board under certain conditions. We have the headspace grass chromatography for finding out chemical presence, anything new or otherwise, which may be a requirement in certain cases, migration tests, dioxins and furans, and also the order test, detecting solvent retention and what hexanol, nonanols are kind of present. I rest my case there. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Wenki, for this very nice presentation and interesting insight into the paper and board business, which is uh, quite important as well. Um, as you mentioned that you need to catch your flight, uh, I would like to give the audience the opportunity to ask you at least two questions uh, right now. So, are there any questions uh, to the presentation of, of Wenki? Obviously not, but then I have a question. <laughs> Um, so my question is, how do you the potential for barrier coatings for mineral oils in the Indian market? Sorry, how, do you? how do you see the potential for mineral oil barrier coatings in the Indian market? I think it will start with the global companies here. So for example, we had requests earlier from Nestle, who actually for Saralac and other grades still use a recycle board as the outer carton, a pouch is there inside. As to in a recycle board, what would be the MOH, MOSH content? But uh, companies which are global will, info, uh, will uh, implement uniform standards. But even Europe has not yet implemented a regulation. So I think it will take some time before this happens. But we want to be ready for it anyway. OK, thank you very much. So then uh, we are lagging in time. And uh, so we need to hurry up. And uh, I would like to give the stage to Clay B from Henkel. And the title of his presentation is Adhesives and Food Safety. OK. Can you all hear me? So good evening, everyone. I will try and be quick, I promise, so that we don't keep everyone away from the dinner and the cocktails. Um, so let me jump straight to the agenda. So oh, before I do that, thank you very much to SIGWORK and to everyone for coming today and talk and reflect a little bit on food safety because it's a really critical topic. And for the next 15 minutes, I would like you to listen to me as a consumer. Forget your day job. Forget that you have to run the factory. Forget about spending money. Think of all these topics as a consumer because at the end of the day, we all are consumer. And when you go to the shop, when you go to the supermarket, do you ask yourself, when you pick up, pick up a packet of biscuits, is it going to be safe or am I going to poison myself? So please play the game with me and, and think of it as a consumer. So the, the, the first point in my presentation, I want to take a step backwards and look at what has changed in the packaging world that has brought food safety to the forefront of the stage. Why is it important? Why are we here today? Then I talk a little bit about what are we doing as Henkel in our adhesives in the solution that we provide to you to help you um, improve the food safety of your product. Then I'll talk quickly about a couple of food safety innovations because food safety shouldn't be the innovation. Having a food safe product shouldn't be a novelty. That's something we want. That's something we expect. So what else can we do? And then I'll wrap up. So what has changed? Um, if you look here, um, I've got a picture of a, a really old bag of washing powder from Henkel. And that was in the early 20th century. If you look today and compare those two types of packages, you can see that the world has become a much more complex place. We used to have simple, simple paper bags. Bottom of the bag was stitched, top of the bag was stitched, one color printed, and that was about it. So the amount of material coming into contact with the goods, with the food, was pretty low. If you look today, you probably all recognize this type of package pouch with a spout glued on, full color printing, the package is laminated, so you've got multiple material there. So the amount of material that can migrate, the complexity has increased tremendously, and that brings more sources of concern, more chances for migration. Um, now I'm going to borrow a, a, a quote from someone from General Mills, um, which is from 2013, so food safety is not something that happened overnight and that is really new. And you can see here 
that they are saying that if you supply a food company, you're no longer just a packaging industry, you're part of the food industry. What they're saying is we treat food packaging with the same food safety rigor as a food ingredient. So if you take 10 seconds to, to think about that, it's really critical because we're not just packaging material now, we are an ingredient of the food that is then going to be packed in. And that says a lot, I think, about what we need to worry about as packaging manufacturer and as provider of adhesives to the packaging industry. Um, what else has changed? Well, we've heard it a little bit. Sources of news are becoming available everywhere and everyone is connected through social media, whether it is Facebook, Twitter, whatever other media. And once the news go out and it's on the internet, you can never take it back. So if you think about food scandals for a minute today, news go out and then it's there and it travels all across the world. And if you allow me, I'll take us out of the packaging world for a minute and, and give you an example of how far the reach goes. So there was a study done in France on a lead baby diapers producer. People, a, a consumer organization took diapers, did some studies with some new analytical techniques and found traces, very, very low quantity of toxic substances. They published the report. A week later, in Japan, the diapers were being pulled off the shelves. Study done in France, one week, diapers being pulled off the shelves in Japan. That's how quickly it went. So that gives you an idea. Imagine now you're selling a product, food product, that will go even faster and that can go all around the world. So there is no way to contain that kind of risk. Now, getting to adhesives, why am I here? Because I'm, hopefully if everything goes well, the machine is rolling smoothly, the adhesive is doing its job, we can forget about the adhesive. Because but it's, we shouldn't, because it's present in both primary and secondary packaging, and it plays a critical role into giving the packaging material its functionality. But it's also, what I was going to say is we shouldn't forget about it, because it plays a role in food safety as well. If you don't use the adhesive right, if you don't choose the right adhesive for the right end use, you might actually add to your migration and make your packaging material unsafe. So we should not forget about the adhesive layer. So all of those trends, what do they mean for adhesives? Customer and consumers want even safer product, and we've heard, it about it, we've heard about it multiple times today. The kind of customers and consumers are looking for a healthy lifestyle, and they're aware and they know what is dangerous and what isn't. As customers, you want faster products. We want to run the line faster than yesterday, not slower. So we need adhesives that set faster. We need to improve the curing speed. Um, the setting speed so we can run the machine faster. And then finally, we also heard it from um, the, the, the opening presentation from, from Tetra Pak. We need to think about sustainability because there is more and more people on the planet and we want to make sure that we don't compromise with what we do today, how our kids and grandchildren are going to live. So sustainability is also very important. So what do these three things mean for um, adhesives and, and what do we do at Henkel to enhance food safety? So we put food safety at the center and at the beginning of every product development. And in order to do that, we focus on quite a few different things. One of them is looking at our raw materials very, very carefully. And we do a lot of assessment. Um, we've talked about NIAS and this is something that we'll talk a little bit about later because this is something that we do a lot of, we, we focus a lot on. Um, we partner with a lot of world-class suppliers in order to develop material or raw material where there isn't any food safe material yet so that we can come up with innovation that are improved for food safety. We also have, I think, toxicologists in Henkel, very proud of it, um, and um, we do a lot of in-house studies. So it's great to identify NIAS but then what do we do? Do we just print it on a piece of paper or do we try and understand and take it further? And I will talk about that in a minute. And then, of course, quality systems, having ISO certified plants, making sure that if you buy the best raw material but you don't follow GMPs, then maybe you're contaminating all of that and all your good pre-work is ruined by your processing. So ISO certification GMP is really, really critical. So now let me touch on a little bit on raw material because 
this is really critical if we want to understand and prevent NIAS and, and all sorts of migration. So why do we focus so much on raw materials? The first step is to understand our raw materials to 100%. Sometimes you look at an MSDS and it says up to 98% of chemical A, and that's it. What's the other 2%? So we try to understand that because those 2% might be dangerous, or they might react and lead to NIAS, things that we didn't really put there, but happened during the process and are dangerous to uh, the human health. We want to identify impurities and byproducts of our products. And again, I'll comment on that with an example. We use test methods to set and monitor the, monitor the specifications to make sure that the raw material we use are always of consistent quality. And because we've been doing that for many years, we have very large databases of purity and chemicals that we can put on a chromatogram and say and identify. So that's really, really helping us understand what we are dealing with every day. Now, this is my slide about connecting the dots. And it's been mentioned um, a few times today already, but this is really something that is important. We need to all work together. And this is why it's great to see so many people here today, because if you do a very good job at, let's say we sell adhesives that are completely food safe, and we sell that to you, and you don't pay too much attention to the quality of the film. Maybe the film is stabilized with TNPP. Maybe there is a sleep agent that will migrate, that will contaminate your food. So we all need to talk to each other, and that goes all the way to the end user, to the consumer. How is the product going to use or going to be used? Because if we don't understand that, how can we then design the packaging material in a way that will protect the food in the right way? So it's really, really critical that we all talk together and that we share the right amount of information so that we can propose and offer the right solution that will help you make your food packaging safer. So now I want to touch a little bit on some of the extracurricular activities that we do. Um, I said that we were looking a lot at um, our raw materials and we also do the same thing with our finished products and we also do studies when we find that something is a bit maybe dangerous or suspicious or there is no data then we put some resources internally to try and understand and model what could happen so we've had some projects for example to model migration of adhesives throughout PET bottles because you could put some simulant in a, in a bottle and wait for a year or wait for so many hours for it to happen. But do you need to do that for every single lab sample that you will develop? No, you don't want to do that. We don't really have time for that. So having a model can help you understand, hey, this category of chemical, this size of molecule is okay. It's not going to migrate and this is not going to be okay. Uh, we did some studies on, on natural latex and cold seals because that can be allergenic. And then the one I would like to talk more about is um, the, the risk assessment that we did on migratable cyclic esters, because that's an example of NIAS, for example. Um, this is something that we do not put in the product. However, we realize that depending on the raw materials that we use, depending on the purity, cyclic esters can form. And when we identified those, we, act, we then found out that there was no real regulatory data about cyclic esters. How do they behave in the human body? Are they okay? Are they being digested? or are they actually accumulating and can cause um, muta mutation in the cells. So you can see here, we embarked on a journey to try and understand what was happening and which maybe cyclic esters were okay, which weren't, we didn't know. And today we are able to write in our food statements facts that we have built up, that we have analyzed, that we got validated on cyclic esters, and we have banned some raw materials from our factories because they were leading to the formation of dangerous cyclic esters that were bioaccumulative. So this is the kind of study that we do in-house to really understand what we are working with and try and improve the food safety because not a lot of people will tell you about cyclic esters, but they are there. And depending on the raw materials that are used to make adhesives, that are used to make polyesters, then you get some of those that can migrate. And you need to know about that, and it is in our food statements. Um, here, just a couple of tips that um, we, we usually share to try and help make your life easier and minimize 
the, the risk of uh, contamination. So there's a couple of pieces there, you know, trying to minimize changeover and have proper cleanup because otherwise you might have side reaction in your tanks, in your glue pots, and that can create, again, NIAS. Um, trying to choose the right adhesive based on the end use is also very, very important. Um, follow the guidelines and the technical data sheet um, when you use adhesive. If the adhesive has to be mixed because it's a dual component, the ratio has been designed by my team to make sure that it is going to be safe in the end. So if you change it, then you might have a negative impact. Um, so just make sure that, that you follow those, uh, those guidelines. So now just a couple of, of innovations, and, and I'll go quickly through that, but that's where I want to say, you know, I started by saying we, food safety shouldn't be something that, you know, is the innovation. It's something that we expect and that we want for all of our products. So what we're trying to do, because we're putting food safety at the beginning of every product development that we do in Henkel, we then take it to the next level and bring additional performances and, and properties so that you can get some of the money back that you, yes, it's true that food safe products tend to be more expensive because of the purity, because of all the requirements that are there. But it doesn't have to be more expensive when you look at the cost in use. And here I've got a couple of examples, you know, looking at sustainability, looking at food safety. We have a whole range of um, polyurethane-based adhesive for the flexible packaging industry uh, with um, heat seal lacquer, cold seal, uh, water-based adhesive as well, and, and primers and cleaners that you can get food statement for. Um, for end-of-line packaging, we've got a, a promo range called Supra, and this is also completely food safe approved. Um, and, and also, it brings you a much lower adhesive consumption and, and much less downtime on the line. So again, food safety, in the end, is paid for because you get all those extra benefits. And for paper converting as well, because we've talked a little bit about plasticizer, uh, we've got a, a, a product range called Equence 9000, and uh, all those products do not contain any plasticizer. They give very good bone strength, very decompatible with other products. So you can use less adhesive, and again, the cost of food safety is paid for. So make sure that you, know, you consider the added benefits of food safety. Uh, now to wrap up, I just want to play a small video, maybe. Can you help me play the video, or can I do it from here? Increasing awareness. Rising food legislations. Growing global food supply chain. Demanding safe and sustainable products. Safety and health is a key pillar in our commitment to sustainability. Together, let's extend beyond and champion the way we package food. Be ahead of the legislations and the market. As our health is in our hands. We want to know what is in our packaging. We care what happens to it along the way. We want to trust that our food is safe. At Henkel, we offer a range of safe packaging adhesives. For paper packaging. And end of line packaging. To flexible packaging. And label adhesives. Our dedicated people work hard to provide best-in-class expertise along the packaging value chain. From what are safe materials? To running safe processes. To proving your safety. We are hungry for a healthier future. So join us. The time is now.
Be food safe with Henkel Solutions. Okay, so that's it. Thank you very much. So those were my conclusions. Just one last thing. Um, if you want to learn more about food safety, you can register for free on our food safety portal and you can uh, register for webinars that are free as well. You can find white papers that explain more about regulation and what is important, what you should take into account when you do your risk assessment. Uh, and you can also ask questions and connect with, with experts. So it's free. Feel free to register and you can get a lot more information. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for this, um, yes, I must say, excellent demonstration on how serious uh, Henkel is taking uh, food safety as well. So thank you very much. Um, coming back from adhesives to inks, I'm happy to ask Jörg, giving his presentation with the title, Food Packaging Compliance, the Ink Manufacturer's Perspective. So, Jörg, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ebert. You hear me? Is microphone on? Yeah. Okay, good. Okay. Um, if you could uh, switch to the presentation, would be nice. Okay. Um, just uh, a, s a short forward. Um, um, the, when I give you the presentation, you might see some similarities to JB's presentation. <laughs> and this is, uh, thank you, and this is, uh, of course, not coincidental. Uh, this is the result uh, of, uh, I would say, responsibly behaving companies. So, okay, so, so let's have a look uh, in my presentation. Um, uh, yeah, uh, Evert, um, and I would like to, to, to link it to Evert's presentation. Evert, um, had his uh, last slide uh, in offering solutions, uh, offering solutions, safe solutions on inks and so on. And the question now is how? Um, how do we do that? How our processes, how we perform that? Um, so that's the agenda, two parts of my presentation, um, ensuring compliance, which is a complex challenge I will explain. And then of course, how we as Siegwerk support you as our customers. Um, Look at uh, this slide here. Uh, indeed, we have to deal uh, in, along the food packaging chain with a complex environment. Um, we have regulations, regional regulations. We have individual brand owner requirements. And we have a complex value chain. Very complex value chain in parts because some of, some of us in the, um, value, in the packaging value chain do have uh, a lot of suppliers. And then, of course, they have to um, put together all the information they get from the suppliers, have to do compliance assessments, and so on. It's not easy. So um, it's really difficult for all of us. And uh, we have to find ways how to manage through that. Then, of course, this is an idealized picture here of the value chain. Um, uh, the message of this um, slide should be everybody has to take his responsibility at his step in the value chain. And of course, you see three levels here. You see the food industry, you see the converters, you see the ink manufacturer. And you can, of course, replace that by other suppliers into the value chain. But of course, um, I look on that as an ink manufacturer. So normally, all the requirements, the requests for food packaging start with the food industry, the packaging specifications. Uh, then, of course, at the converters level, the packaging conception is done. Then we, as ink manufacturers, have to develop and supply, give you advice how to use. Then, of course, it goes back here to, the, to you as a converter. Process validation has to be done at your premises. And in the end, the final validation is up to the food industry. So basically, uh, the message is, yeah, we have to talk to each other. I can only uh, confirm what uh, JB has been um, stating. Um, we have to talk up and down the chain. We have to understand um, what uh, the specific product is all about. What do we want to do? What is the application? Is it, is it heat? Do we apply heat? Is it for deep freeze application? Is it for baby, baby food, whatever? We all need to understand that. However, the most important topic is we as Siegberg, we stick to our responsibility and we, do, we take our responsibility really serious along the packaging chain. Um, looking on the, um, I mentioned um, uh, there is legal requirements. Yes, uh, this is just, um, the slide is just showing you indeed there is legal requirements on a global scale 
And wherever you come, wherever you produce, wherever you manufacture, in every country worldwide, you have some kind of packaging regulations. Whether it's more generic, whether it's more specific, this is another question. But in every country here, you have to stick to some requirements. Yeah? And um, so you see uh, uh, also here, specifically in Asia, India, there is requirements, of course, and um, uh, Bangladesh and, and wherever you see that on the slide. So having said, having mentioned that the requirements are different, um, it's now time to introduce what has been mentioned already um, earlier in the afternoon. Um, what is ink-specific regulation? And of course, on top of this, um, there is the uh, manifold quoted um, Swiss ink ordinance. Because the Swiss ink ordinance is the only mandatory ink regulation so far existing worldwide. And it has been introduced in 2010. It has, by the way, been revised in May of this year. Um, and it consists of positive lists. And the positive lists are very, very comprehensive. Um, they consist of about 5,000 plus materials. And they're split into two parts. One part is evaluated, toxicological evaluated materials, which is the minority. It's about 1,200 materials. And the, uh, the major part of it, that's the part B, is non-evaluated, which are subjected to a 10 ppb threshold. So why is the Swiss ink audience so important? Well. Uh, it's not only applied in Switzerland, but because to, or due to the fact that some uh, brand owners, um, like for example Nestle, have made it part of their ink specifications, it has seen global distribution. So that's the reason why we have to pay such uh, respect to the um, Swiss ordinance. As opposed to that, looking on the Indian situation, we have a voluntary standard. It's not mandatory, it's voluntary. It's since 2004. Um, and it has also a different scope, like the, uh, the Swiss ink ordinance is only for um, indirect food contact. Here in India we have um, secondary um, indirect food contact, direct, transient, whatever. And it's not necessarily a, a positive list, it's an exclusion or negative list and positive list only in case of um, direct food contact. And it is a national reference. Okay, we have heard um, that something will change and, and, and we see and we are of course happy to contribute to this discussion. So um, it's now time to have a look also mentioning um, legal requirements, um, mentioning what's going on on European um, EU level. EU, when I talk EU, I mean the countries which are um, linked together in European Union. It's 28 countries. And um, so um, uh, there is at the moment only generic requirements in, um, in, the, the, um, in, in the EU on, on, on inks. It's a framework regulation which applies. And, um, and that is the situation the EU Commission is going to change. So, um, and not only the EU uh, Commission is going to change, but also um, uh, there has been an initiative of Germany, a national initiative like in Switzerland, um, to issue a national uh, legislation on inks for food packaging. However, uh, when the Germans notified that uh, to the European Union, the EU, EU Commission and uh, several member states rejected this German notification proposal and said, no, 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 you can't go on that, um, on, uh, on, on a, and continue on that, uh, with that on a national level we want to take over and we want to look for a harmonized um, printed food contact material regulation in Europe. And of course, this is an important um, message because it's very likely um, that this new regulation may override the Swiss ordinance. So um, the question is, OK, when is this uh, European uh, ink regulation um, to come into play? Uh, the plans are um, that there will be a draft by mid-2018 and um, uh, the implementation shall take place end of 2018. So it's very ambitious. Yeah? It's, it's coming soon. And I think since we have some, um, uh, also some representatives here um, of FSAI here, it's interesting to look at some of the potential elements um, of that um, uh, new EU regulation. Um, as they are currently proposed um, by the Commission, but also by industry. So 
the motto uh, of this legislation, and this is from the EU, uh, is that legislation, it should be legislation that works in practice, so it should be practical. It should be effective, efficient, and enforceable. Yeah? I think every legislator can definitely subscribe to that, right? So, and now, interesting question is, um, what will happen um, in terms of positive lists? Yes, the idea is to take existing positive lists, um, like um, from uh, 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 fully evaluated uh, materials, um, um, and, um, and say, okay, there is already toxicological assessment. Why not put, them, put all of these materials in a positive list and make it mandatory to the ink industry and, of course, to the print, uh, printers, uh, to the converters? So that is the idea. One list, fully evaluated materials. And the part two is something different. And this um, has to do now with toxicological risk assessments, um, which could be done without a complete full evaluation uh, based on toxicological testing. I will show you later. Because basis of this um, risk assessment should be so-called QSAR assessment, so quantitative uh, structure activity relationship uh, uh, um, um, uh, assessments, which, which, which is an instrument in toxicology which is in, uh, in the meantime quite accepted and quite widespread. Then the interesting question will be what will be the focus? The focus um, should be the applications with the, higher, the highest consumer impact and that is um, of course, non-food contact. Not direct food contact, but non-food contact. And if you take a look, the definition even, um, that's most very likely that this is going to be the definition of an ink. Yeah? Mixtures of colorants with other substances applied on materials to form a graphic or decorative design. Other or colored or uncolored overprint varnishes and coatings or primers which are normally applied in combination with these inks. So that is basically the definition. It's not very easy to find a really um, all descriptive definition of an ink in that respect. And it's nice that uh, we have that definition already. Very interesting, and that is um, the final remark on, these, um, on this European regulation. Um, there is a cooperation at the moment along the entire packaging chain. The entire packaging chain is at the moment um, discussing this printed food contact material regulation as giving input. Um, and I was very happy to hear um, uh, this afternoon that there is also a kind of uh, request here from the uh, Indian government um, to, to cooperate when it comes down to um, setting up a specific Indian ink regulation. Okay, so um, that's the regulatory part. I talked about um, the self-commitments and, and the brand owner requirements. And um, yeah, that's another aspect we need to um, think about. Um, and, um, and it's uh, basically coming down to Nestle, but also others. Uh, it's also Perfetti um, and others who are having specific um, brand owners who are having specific requirements on inks for food packaging. And of course, we need to pay respect to those. And these specifications are constantly and regularly updated. So we have to be aware and follow them. So. Um, now, talking about the self-commitment and about responsibilities. Um, this is what we as Siegberg have uh, committed to. It is a self-commitment um, yeah, for packaging safety and it is um, signed by our CEO. By our CEO, Herbert Forker, the key elements. Consumer safety first, compliance with legislation, of course. Transparency in the supply chain, <coughs> fit for purpose uh, products and risk assessment, that's very important, based on scientific recognized principles. So what does that mean? It's just a piece of paper. So you would like to know now, okay, and so, and what? So uh, let's have a look. What are we doing? What's standing behind? So um, basically, our commitment is based on three columns. Um, this is systematic processes. This is product safety guidance, and this is proactive uh, work for product safety. These three columns. And now let's have a deeper look onto the processes. So, um, one of very important process, we have heard it from JB, is of course the raw material introduction process. Because if you don't control 
the quality of your raw materials, you do not uh, have any control about the quality of your product. So it all starts here. And this is the process which has to be very, yeah, I would say, has to be very stringent, has to have very stringent requirements um, and has to be done with great care. And um, so um, what we also do is we, and we have heard it before, we also insist on 100% uh, disclosure of the raw materials which we are using. And it is a very generic situation which you described, JB, that if, um, if you buy raw materials, you get 98% uh, of the uh, main raw materials, and then you ask yourselves, indeed, as you said, what about the rest of the two? So in the meantime, I think um, there, is be, there has been a rethinking also uh, at the chemical suppliers, who has, have in the past um, been very reluctant to disclose details, but uh, due to some uh, non-disclosure agreements and, uh, and those kind of stuff, um, it is now possible to, to get um, really um, uh, detailed information, provided you are really serious with the non-disclosure, of course. That's, that's, that's a prerequisite, of course. Yeah? So it's all about trust. Yeah? And um, via that, um, we are really able also to, to have information up to the latest PPMs yeah, of our raw materials. And I de definitely agree. Yeah? It can be uh, that uh, even, uh, let's say, uh, in the PPM range, if you have a, an impurity in the PPM range, um, we can have a problem later. Yeah? Because we talk in toxicological terms about PPB levels which matter. Yeah? So this is very important. So, um, of course, our exclusion criteria are stringent, as I said, excluding CMR materials, carcinogenic, mutagenic, rep reprotoxic materials, but also a lot of other materials um, uh, like uh, dioxins uh, in, 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 in pigments which can, which can um, occur. And that, again, um, leads to the, um, the need for understanding um, the supply chain, for understanding the manufacturing process of the raw material. Because if you don't understand it, you cannot ask the right question. So you need to go take it a step further. You need to go backwards. You need to understand how, okay, what is the synthesis process of the respective raw material in order to be able um, to, to set up the right requirements. And this is what we are doing um, thanks to our specialists which are um, uh, allocated in a global team and um, they're in my team. So, um, but then the question comes, yeah, um, paperwork, there seems to be a lot of paperwork, but is paper for paperwork sufficient? No, it is not. Because, um, yeah, you can of course manipulate the paperwork. You can, um, yeah, you can, you, can, you can say yes, I claim this to be, but yeah, uh, it could be that uh, there is uh, some wrong information, and we have seen that. So, what we have to do is spot check testing. So, and that's what we're doing. So, that's what I mean in, uh, when I say we take the product safety work serious. So, we do spot check testing on a regular basis. There are um, spot check testing reports, annual reports, um, which, um, which really um, take it to the step of controlling um, the raw material suppliers, auditing the raw material suppliers, uh, from us, go to China, go to India, look at the production sites, and look if everything is okay. And, um, and basically, um, we are uh, benefiting from that, and, um, and of course, you as our customers as well, because you then really know, yeah, uh, or you can, can assume uh, products are safe, which we are using. But it is a lot of effort and costs a lot of, um, uh, costs a lot of money. Then, first, raw material introduction process. But now, what we have heard, there are manifold requirements uh, to be followed, positive list, exclusion criteria worldwide. So if you know a formulator um, in, the, um, in the application uh, technology department, you have uh, now the raw material list, and, um, and now you need to know, uh, in also, knowing that there are specific migration limits and, and these things uh, may be allocated to certain raw materials, you need to know what is the maximum concentration I can put into the formulation that the end product in the end is still compliant with these requirements. 
For that, we have created the formulation guideline, which you can understand basically as a cooking recipe. Yeah? <laughs> and, and say, OK, if you use this material at max, I don't know, 1%, 5%, whatever it takes. Yeah? And this is done um, uh, according to a thorough assessment, a worst case calculation scenario. But also, with this tool, we are controlling um, uh, new information which pops in. Um, of course, we are uh, living in a world where information constantly changes and the scientific progress um, is, is existing. And, and of course, uh, some raw materials uh, get reclassifications and things like that, so you need to react. So you have to go to phase-out scenarios. Therefore, we have this traffic light system. Green, of course, you can take it. Uh, yellow, you have to take care. We, we might want to um, um, uh, validate um, the use of this material and red, of course, no, no, uh, phase out, yeah? No, no use anymore. So that is the formulation guideline. Now, what I have been um, talking about um, is basically also, like um, Evert has um, uh, addressed in his presentation, mainly IS, intentionally added substances, but we know when we talk about impurities, and especially when we get this information about the raw materials, there is also a lot of nice, non-intentionally added substances around. And this is what we see in the meantime in Europe, um, uh, in the market, um, from NGOs, from um, uh, uh, yeah, um, interested parties like uh, Foodwatch, and also authorities. They are asking, OK, you always claim to be safe on that on the, on the parts which you know, but what is on the parts you don't know? What is about the nice? So we need to have also an answer on that. And that is where risk assessment comes into play and where risk assessment is so fundamental. And risk assessment, as you know, is consisting of two parts. We have heard it um, uh, from Nestlé uh, early in the afternoon. It's hazard assessment times exposure assessment. So let's have a look at the hazard assessment. What can we do um, on hazard assessment? And th that's basically uh, the question, what is the safe, tolerable daily dose of an IS? So first of all, in principle, you could, can have a look. Uh, is there a specific migration limit existing, but which, which would um, mean that there is already a toxicological ev evaluation existing from an authority? If you don't have that, you look on the supplier's information, um, or you look into um, toxicological databases then you can self-derive a specific migration limit. It's possible, yeah? because if you know what is the no adverse observed effect level, then you can derive um, uh, uh, NSML. Um, there is also the possibility, as I said, of the QSAR predictions. That's what we do. Yeah? We can do read across. There is this uh, so-called TTC concept, TOX3 concept. So these are all existing concepts and models which are acknowledged by toxicologists worldwide which we apply in order to make a risk assessment with the aim to declare um, a non-intentionally added substance either safe or it could also be, in the other hand, not safe. And then we say, OK, we, can't, we have to uh, replace that material. There is no way. <clears throat> and taking it to the further step, well, talking non-intentionally added substances, there is also another category. You can, you can split these uh, NIAs into those where you know the structure, and then there, were, there are, of course, non-intentionally added substances where you don't know the structure. Where you don't know the structure, all these models don't apply. What do you do then? Then, of course, and this is now taking it to the further step, and this is a little bit also the future, you can do bioassays. Because the crucial question from a, from a um, legal point, from a regulator point, would be, is there a genotoxic potential? Yeah? And you would like to rule it out. So that you can do with bioassays. And, um, and we are investigating into that. So that is our way to do hazard assessment. Exposure assessment, um, that's the next step. Um, yeah, the question is, OK, what is the estimated daily exposure to an IS? Um, and there you, of course, can, do several, uh, can, do, sir, can uh, undergo several steps. One is the, the simplest, worst case calculation. You just assume that the material in question migrates to 100% into the foodstuff. That's the worst case calculation. If you then find that the value um, is below the SML, fine. 
But if it's above, okay. Then you have to verify. Then you can do, before go, you go to migration testing, and maybe this is not a, such a, a good message for SGS as a testing house, but you can do migration modeling. Yeah? There is, in the meantime, software available where you can do migration modeling with the software. It works very well, and it is also accepted. Yeah? And only if that would not work, yeah? and there are, of course, certain um, cases where it doesn't work, then you can do migration testing. And the more advanced approach then in terms of exposure assessment would be not only to go to the migration um, uh, assessment and then go to these uh, assumptions like we have in Europe. Look, in Europe we have the assumption there is a 60 kilo person. I don't, of course, uh, uh, fall into this category. Yeah? And this uh, 60 kilo person consumes one kilogram of food a day be it chocolate, be it milk, be it honey, what, everything. Yeah? This is the simplistic approach. You can replace that when you have uh, consumption factors, food consumption factors, when you really know what the population is consuming per uh, uh, kind of uh, foodstuff. And then, of course, uh, that has a, a, um, a big influence on the exposure assessment, but I would, I would hardly assume that the average person is eating one kilogram of chocolate for the lifetime. Yeah? I, would, I think you would, you would die from, I don't know, uh, adiposis or whatever, but, but not from eating, uh, eating the cho uh, chocolate. So, and from a toxicological as aspect. So, um, uh, that is what's possible. Now, if you combine uh, hazard assessment, exposure assessment, and if you now do risk management, yeah, you have two levers. You see here, either on the hazard side, you replace this high hazard, which is symbolized by this great white shark, <coughs> you replace it by a dolphin. Yeah? That is the substitution. Yeah? Okay, fine. Then you have, of course, considerably reduced your risk. Yeah? And that is done. And that is done. Do we do that? Yeah? Of course we do that. Or you go to the exposure side uh, and uh, reduce the exposure. How can you do that? Yeah? Oh, okay. In, in, if you apply a barrier, then of course there will be no migration anymore, and so you have also a safe scenario. Of course, this is a uh, talking um, uh, polyolefin films or certain polyolefin films. Certainly not so easy, yeah, and maybe not the the, the way uh, you can do it, uh, but it's a possibility. So that's how risk management works. Um, we shall not forget, we are still talking about processes, how we safeguard um, the um, consumer safety. Uh, we have uh, good manufacturing practices. We have decided at Siegwerk to adopt uh, what is called UPIA, European Printing Association, a GMP globally, on a global scale. Because formally, this uh, UPIA GMP only applies um, to um, member um, companies of European Printing Inc. Association. So um, uh, we have um, uh, subscribed to the, uh, uh, to the fact that we are applying it globally. And um, it's a standalone standard. Um, it is specific to ink requirements, and it has been launched in 2016, last year. So um, if you are compliant with this UPR GMP, it also means that you are automatically compliant with existing uh, good manufacturing practice regulations, which we have in Europe and in China. And moreover, um, it is a matter of fact that um, there is a high similarity between the UPR GMP and the IFS 6 um, uh, accredited standards like BRC, IOP, ISO 22000, etc., etc. So that is, that is really a benefit. Yeah? And the other benefit is that this standard and this, this good manufacturing practice can easily be audited by you as a converter or by a brand owner. Um, and um, uh, because we are working on FMEA, failure mode um, and effects analysis, and based on risk assessments. And of course, uh, when you do such a risk assessment, you have a paper you can demonstrate. So that's easily to be audited. So that's what we are doing. Now, product safety guidance. Um, yeah, of course, um, this is very important, and this is basically all about issuing information along the packaging supply chain in order to put our customers into the position to 
on their side do the risk assessments on the right on the right fields what does it mean that means that we are informing on migrants on potential migrants which which is our so-called statement of composition so we have been uh, listening um, this afternoon that the biggest problem is coming of course from the migrating materials so um, if you want to control that and if you are now on a converters um, uh, site uh, uh, how can you how can you do any any risk assessment if you don't know what you have to look for so this is where we are committing ourselves to give you specific information of the migrants uh, present in the respective product which we deliver to you and it's uh, in the form of a table um, it's very specific it's containing cast numbers so chemical abstract numbers very clearly identifying what is the material to look for um, it's giving you information on existing specific migration limits in existing worldwide global regulations and it's even giving you an idea about the maximum concentration in the dried ink film. So with this information it's easily uh, possible to do a worst case calculation and to see if there is no other migrant in the packaging in question, no other coming pro probably from the adhesives or from the substrate or from wherever, yeah? You, we hear no, no, no migrants in the thesis, okay, <laughs> okay, um, and and if there, if this is the if this is the case, okay, then you can do a worst case calculation and thus uh, already um, do uh, compliance work in the print shop, and you you don't need to uh, go further to uh, a third party testing house, yeah. So this is really um, uh, uh, transparent, and uh, that's what we are doing. Don't mix it up this statement of composition with a, um, with a disclosure. It's not a complete disclosure on all raw materials because it's not needed. It is a disclosure on migrating uh, species. Very important. But this is what we have to worry about. Yeah? Now, second part um, of this um, information which we uh, give, and uh, uh, this is, uh, of course, important, is the technical data sheet. The technical data sheet which is giving information on the um, field of application, be it non-food, be it direct food contact, and also if it's two component systems, um, what is the um, uh, uh, ratio to mix it and what is um, certain other converting parameters to be observed in order to be on the safe side. That is all uh, comprised in the technical data sheet. Now, um, finally, um, yeah, proactive work for product safety, what does that mean? Yeah? Second last slide, that means... Uh, I think uh, what I'm trying to show here is a complete layman's view. Uh, so I, I've uh, heard few speakers in the last session especially talk about very prudent points that we are all here to look at compliance from a layman's perspective or a consumer perspective. And we are talking about compliance in a most reactive manner as of date today. Regulations give you the guidelines to the industry as to what you're supposed to be doing and often tend to go with probably the most optimal standards that can be achieved in a particular jurisdiction. They're not all encompassing. So if EU comes up with a regulation which says, I want parts per billion, in the other side of the world, it's never going to happen. But we all strive to get to those levels. So I think the responsibility that the pioneering organizations take up is very critical looking at how a product innovation that has been brought out by them is going to influence the future of the industry globally, right? So that is where large multinational players play a very important role, right? And looking at my slides, I'm sure you've already seen all of it, but I'm again going to probably bore you up for the next 15 minutes about what it is uh, from the layman's perspective, okay? Uh, what you're seeing is, I think most of you have covered this. I'm not sure if you can read it. Myself, I cannot probably read it. But let's understand it again from a consumer standpoint. Have we understood that the cultural norms and the customs play a very critical role in what kind of a packaging we are looking at? We're also supposed to be looking at the innovation of the technology materials. We heard Venki talk about introduction of a nanomaterial all of a sudden in the, in, in the packaging material. What are the impacts of it? You guys are chemical scientists, but nowadays 
I'm bringing in a technology chip there and putting it. What is the impact of it? Probably you would not have understood it fully, but it's our responsibility to look at it and understand it as a whole, right? Then we are also looking at the increasing awareness. Now I want to talk about conservation. I want to be the Mr. Good Samaritan of the world, try to pass on all the goodness to my next generations. So the sustainability is a very key factor that we need to be factoring as we go through any product creation and its supply chain, right? So there are again a lot of things. From a commercial angle, theft is probably or counterfeiting uh, and uh, protection or damage protection is very critical for the business standpoint. But this also adds in a extra layer. Like you know, you would see that a business would not blink an eye to invest the extra few cents or rupees in the packaging material to prevent counterfeiting or damages, but would hesitate to spend the extra cent on the packaging for enhancing its safety. So this is the mind shift that we all need to bring in, and I think that's only possible when we look at it as a shared responsibility, right? So these are some of the factors. We know what the function of a packaging is all about, but again, you're looking at some exponential growth in the packaging sector itself. We're talking about the reduction of the overall packaging footprint that needs to happen. But nevertheless, there is a huge demand for packing more and more things, be it convenience packing, be it for counterfeiting, or being it for your brand protection and things like that, right? So I think we have seen the evolution from those traditional glass bottles, paper bottles, now all kinds of materials being tested out, and finally we are now into the age of plastic in different formats. But again, we are again going back the full circle. So now the biggest fad is to go back into those traditional glass bottles when we are coming into the beverages and things like that. So, you know, probably it's just going around and coming back. But when you're looking at the scale of operations, when you're, when you're looking at getting your product through the world, through the different channels of uh, sales that are prevalent, we need to be factoring measures that will be brought in so that whatever you are doing as a research in the lab is in fact what you are seeing at the last mile when a consumer picks up your product in an, you know, God forbidden village, which is never on the map also, right? You know, so that's, that's the mindset we need to bring about when we are looking at uh, the safety uh, elements of the packaging, right? So I think now the latest trend is all about uh, the flexi standing, uh, uh, self-standing uh, packaging, which we have been seeing, reuse, single-use packaging, with a lot and a lot of emphasis of it being uh, the face of uh, your branding and uh, the consumer messaging that is required out. So here we see again the different uh, statistics in terms of what the different packaging material are bringing out to the table. We see that flexible packaging is really catching up with the paper-based, which has been traditionally out there, right? So again, in 2020, we are seeing some uh, increased trend for this uh, flexi-packing uh, industry as a whole. So let's see uh, a little more in terms of the usage. Here is an interesting uh, uh, you know, dynamic that we have to observe. You see the people who have pioneered in terms of the safety regulations, the norms that are required for packaging material, have almost plateaued out. They are not going and increasing more and more of their flexi-packing uh, or the packaging footprint. But whereas the other countries are on a very rapid rise. So if, if about 20 years back, if uh, anyone here would remember going into the market, you used to carry your own bag, you used to go, get your things, come back, very minimal packing. But today, we are going on a race and saying that I want everything packed, I do not want it to be contaminated, the freshness sealed, you know, I want a plastic bag. So, there are, so there's a lot of consumer-driven uh, behavior that is, uh, you know, surging up the market uh, need here for the packaging material, right? So need to segregate. One size does not fit all, right? And finally, I think the most important thing that we all need to understand is the sustainability. Like, you know, we are not here and Earth is not just for us. It's for us to give on to the next generations too. So in looking at that, let's not try to say, 
uh, all right, I can use plastic and I can dump it off. If I'm depleting the water layer, so be it. So that mindset again has to change in every stakeholder. And when we talk about every stakeholder, I, I really appreciated the statement of their leadership, which is not just a piece of paper, but a thought process driven into every person in the value chain. Unless all of us take a pledge that we are responsible for the sustainability and we understand the impact that the packaging would have on the product, its safety, and the environment, we are never ever going to achieve what we have to, right? So I think from a regulatory perspective, enough has been covered. I'm not going to bore again all the individuals here. But just one uh, point to be highlighted here is that we either mimic in uh, a lot of anxiety that, uh, say for in example in India, we are now saying that we would like to adopt Codex and bring it out on one hand while we are struggling out packaging in newspaper, which is probably the worst thing that can happen. So you know, there is no parity when we are trying to uh, copy paste uh, the international regulation. So I think as regulators, the importance is to understand the given constraints and to tailor a regulation that is amicable to the industry and the consumer. So it should be an incremental path of regulatory control. Right? So again, from the environmental impact, as we are saying, you know, that communication is very important. If as a consumer, we are all looking at the plastic bottles that are being put up for water, the convenience factor of the consumer is important, but nevertheless, the awareness is also equally important that what am I doing with this particular packaging material and how am I able to recycle it or you know, uh, make it a, a, a less more intense packaging material, right? So that is very important for us to look at. And again, when we are talking about creation of environmentally friendly packaging material, we should be looking at, as large industries, there may be a thrust of innovation that is coming out and trying to create new packaging material. But also the innovation happens a lot when you are looking at the MSME sector. For example, if you go to street food vendors, you would see that one guy would start trying to pack out, uh, so we used to have in Delhi, all the teas being transported in plastic bags. No one ever conceived that you're going to create a packaging material for transporting tea, but it was created. So those kind of things, you know, we, we should not be just closing out our eye and uh, forgetting about that responsibility. So the innovation of packaging can happen at anywhere in the spectrum, be it a small player to a large player. But the concept of the safety and the responsibility should be driven out end to end, right? So I think I'm just going to quickly ask a few slides. Look at these bottled water, the ready meals. These are all the things that are putting a great pressure on the environment at the end of the day. So let's all understand as consumers, as responsible human beings, that what is the impact that is happening out and see how all we can uh, come together, be it in terms of recycling, innovation of the product, looking at the uh, uh, you know, responsible activities in recycling these materials for different activities, uh, and all these things we need to come out uh, in a more structured way. Right? Again, waste bags and shopping bags, we all uh, have a great focus. Today we have uh, in Indian laws uh, a simple thing that you know, I'm going to put in a cost associated for recycling of a plastic bag. So that was a deterrent into the market. But just let's understand this concept. As a deterrent, we are charging about five or 10 bucks for, again, a plastic bag of certain micron. Instead, for the same amount, the same regulation could have stipulated, let me use an alternative material, probably a jute bag or a cloth bag. I do not know. But that's where we all need to start orienting ourselves. Now, we talk about uh, the influence of uh, transferability of the inks, the adhesives, etc. There is no, again, regulation talking about what you're printing out on your shopping bag. And I'm now taking cut fruit, cut vegetables, and uh, probably uh, a piece of meat that is not properly wrapped up in the same plastic bag. The bleed effect, the transfer effects on the food not being considered. We talk about creating paper cups. Now, very beautifully on the paper cup, you would have a 
marketing information being printed out of the brand. We are not enforcing about an edible ink there. There's a contact that is happening there. So there is a huge lack of awareness along the supply chain as to what is the true impact. And I think that is where we are all dependent upon mostly a reactive mode of surveillance. Like we have labs that test out and give out a certificate that, yes, your material is food grade, good to go, but never looks at how the food grade is impacted in the real market. So for this, we need to start looking at, as one of the speaker also mentioned, a very proactive surveillance mechanism in the market space. Are you truly going out and picking up a randomized sample from a village, from a uh, you know, organized uh, trade, or from the e-com, and then bring it all up? Look at the portfolio. Then draw out your bell curve of compliance. That's what we need to be looking at more actively when we are talking about overall safety and compliance, right? So I think this last slide is the only technical slide I wanted to put in that talks various elements of how the impact of paperboard versus plastic is. Definitely the perception that paper uh, is better than the plastic is out. Obviously, all of you know it very well. But now as we are uh, moving on to the biopolymers, there's a huge opportunity for us to look at. And again, that's the market that is not just going to happen like that. Uh, as one of the speaker also pointed out, it is very important that the regulations also support, the market conditions are also supported. India has a huge agri-production where we do not even have abundance of the food processing sector, let alone looking at the waste that are coming in, like the bio-waste and utilizing in the packaging sector. So I think we need to look at it more holistically and try to bring in all the stakeholders for a unified solution, right? Here are some of the challenges, which I'm again not going into detail, but the specific challenges include labeling. I'll give you examples where I have been witness to. You have beautiful imported products that come in, whereas the speakers also alluded, they go to great lengths to look at what is the bleed factor of your adhesive, the ink onto the product and everything else. The container comes, we have a local importer who buys glues cheap from the local market, which is non-food grade, puts in a sticker in the laser printer, puts it out, and puts it onto the food product. Gone. Your entire safety is gone to the uh, tubes. So we, this is where we all need to understand. Uh, how are we trying to bring in some regulations, and how are we going to bring in the awareness amongst all the people to ensure that the product is really safe in the market, right? That said, I'll move on to, in closing, I think global standards, see, there should be a baseline that, uh, you know, the think tanks like the Codex or people uh, at, at a global level should say, here is the bare minimum standard that the packaging material should comply no matter what country you are. That's an absolute necessity. And then incrementally guidelines on how each country can start adding up onto these regulations is the need of the hour. Because it's no longer, the food chain is no longer limited to a small jurisdiction, especially in the FMCG sector, we see that the world is a global village. So let's start looking at it from that direction. The synchronization of the regulations is an absolutely important thing. Within India itself, I can give you an example. There's legal metrology, there's food act, there is Drugs and Cosmetics Act. Everyone talks and views packaging in a completely different connotation. There needs to be a harmonization in the thought process and therefore the alignment of the regulatory controls. Then we are looking at the country-wise specifications and the regulations. There should be clarity because when we are talking about manufacturers doing their product, they can no longer just look at that product from their geographic spread only. You know, international regulations like the FISMA now are talking about implications of the importers at the source country. So let us understand what is the global perspective of these regulations also, right? Awareness, probably that cannot be emphasized enough. Awareness as a common platform for everyone, primarily from a consumer perspective, is very, very important when it comes to the packaging material. And then finally, uh, if we are all in it together, we will all have to contribute it together, and only then 
packaging industry can truly bring the value add for the FMCG sector. That's all I have. So thank you very much for this very useful and helpful overview. Thanks a lot. Um, as you see, in the meantime, Wenki has left. He's on the way to the airport. So there are only three speakers available and uh, taking potential questions. Yes, over there. Hey, Raghu, uh, heard with very great interest uh, your views on food safety not just being of the organized trade but also of the end consumer in the rural villages of India. Uh, just wanted to uh, probe a bit more. In your experience with your research, do you find any other market with such diversity? And if so, how has these regulations been implemented in such markets? And what are your thoughts on how this could be a so b before the answer, could you shortly tell us your name and where are you working? Oh, sorry. Uh, my name is Ramesh. I work with PepsiCo. I think uh, yeah, that's a very valid question. There are a lot of parallels that we see globally. Um, in terms of the unorganized to organized, probably India stands out a little unique because uh, I think about 10 years back when we looked at the statistics, it was something like 92 for uh, a 10 percent uh, market uh, uh, between unorganized and organized. Um, you know, today we have at least about 50 lakh uh, uh, food businesses that are licensed, be it small or large. That kind of brings up into uh, the proportions of what we are looking at. But the initial estimates again are about 5 million food business operators in the country out of which we are at 50 lakh licenses or registration. So there is still a predominant section that we do not know of, whether it exists or doesn't exist or it is licensed or unlicensed. In, in terms of uh, the efficacy of uh, the delivery of any regulatory control at the rural levels, there are a lot of examples we can look at. Taiwan, uh, uh, Thailand again is a beautiful example. Even if you are talking about food being supplied in small river boats, the compliance is maintained because there is training given out to those operators. So I think to the same extent, even the Indian regulators have also started taking up the awareness of the street food vendors, which is the big chunk of uh, the Indian food uh, ecosystem. So these things are happening. But you know, you're, you're started too late in the game and with too few resources. So therefore, again, the underlying emphasis of our shared responsibility comes up predominantly. If we as consumers are going into the village, we are probably, the group here sitting is the cream of the crop. We know about food safety, we know about the influences of packaging material and all that. But if we go and see in a rural village something has been packed in a newspaper, we tend to say, let the officer come and take care of it, not me. That itself is a gap. That's where the underlying message we have is a shared responsibility. Unless every one of us think of it as this is my responsibility to look at it and do it right, you're going to help out a number of people by that. That's the best way to go forward on this. But there are examples. So there's one more question here on the left side, over there. Uh, sorry. It is not a question. In fact, by the last presentation, I am promoted to say a statement which may be 20 or 50 years in advance, but I think uh, with such a wonderful platform of international participant that when we say about one globe, one country or so, can't we have one specification for a particular project as we have, for example, quality management system. We say ISO 17025. ISO 9000. Similarly, for the specification on plastics, we have CFR, FDA, FAO, BIS, all these things. I know the constraints of the country, but it may be 15 years in advance, I am saying this is a statement. Can't we have one standard globally acceptable so that we can be 
jointly going ahead in this direction. This is just a thought process which came up in mind, which I wanted to share with you. That's a very nice vision. <laughs> okay, there was another question over there. My name is Ravi Gupta. Can I ask? Or somebody is uh, before me? Okay, I'm starting. Again, this is not my uh, question. It is a request. Uh, many of the, or couple of uh, uh, presentation of the uh, presenters or the learned uh, speakers over here are not uh, visually uh, seen because of the smaller fonts or because of some faults in the system. So I would request the organizers to please share these presentations so that they cannot be, because nobody can learn, nobody can remember all these things in four hours, around 16 presentations. So they can only be useful if they hand, if they, if we have them on, on our uh, PC. Yeah. So uh, my yeah. request is this, please share all these presentations with the uh, present people so that we can be more, they can be more helpful to us. Thank uh, you. As, as a practice, these presentations are uploaded on YouTube and you'll be able to see them. Yes, the, that will be link, uh, shared with all the delegates. The link will be shared. Thanks uh, for that comment. And there was another question here. Yeah, yeah, yes, I'm just okay. waiting. <laughs> uh, it's for the adhesive. I just wanted to know, uh, for the pressure sensitive labels, we generally have uh, hot melt or acrylic based uh, adhesives. Of these two, which one is more prone to migration and uh, any, any idea? It's hard to answer without knowing where you're applying them. I think depending on how you use them and the quality you buy, um, it's, it varies. I would say probably hot melts are slightly safer. If you're, using, if you're doing the reaction, the curing of the acrylic in-house, then you might have issues. If it's already in solvent, you've got issue with sol possible issues with solvent. So intrinsically, I would say hot melts are, are safer but it depends again on where you buy them from. So that would be my guess, but we would have to speak more specifically on the application and the end use. Okay, fine. So last question. Thank you very much, sir. My name is Sunil Katheria. I came to this conference like a student, that's it. And as a consumer, I would like to, you know, uh, share some of uh, the things. See, uh, I learned a lot about the food safety and the toxic part of the business. And in India is a very diversified country, you know. And from uh, rural now from, to urban, the country is transforming. And there the role of you guys plays a very important role to us. And, uh, you know, we Indians have a specific behavior. Sometimes we are too aggressive, sometimes we are too cautious, and sometimes we are absolutely silent and inert. That's our blood vessels. Sometimes we take a lot of care, sometimes we do not. There are two bad incidents happens in my life. Those is forcing me to think about it and sharing something. One thing is when I was in school and uh, in primary class, there was an essay, if you made prime minister of the country, what you'll do? So I was very honest with the situation and uh, I thought I'll never be a prime minister of the country, so nothing can be done and I failed in the exam. So my parents kicked me, my teacher kicked me, and I just carried on my life like that only. Last year, my daughter got very terribly uh, ill. She has uh, choked uh, lungs because of the toxins, the vaporizer we use in home, and all the nonsense, number of combinations. She was about to die, but God says she's safe now. She's three years old. Then I decided I'll contribute to the society. I'll try to find out whenever I'm using some package, what is wrong there. Like we were using Colgate, it is very clearly written on the Colgate that below, children below six years should not use it. If they are using, they should be in the supervision of the parents and they should be using only a piece size. But we see advertisement and a brush we have, we are, they are showing the user completely and we are just brushing our teeth with a complete full uh, you know, width of the brush. Then I started you know, looking into each and everything after my kids you know, it was really in tr trouble. So I was become very cautious about the food packaging, toxins, and each and everything that apply in my life. So I decided to open a, you know, uh, my passion is to, you know, contribute to society. Next year, I am setting up an NGO with my daughter's name, Samdrishti. I'm trying to, you know, educate the people around me, schools. Maybe I will associate your all websites. 
I'll seek your help into this. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you. I think uh, we may, with your permission, we can close the session because we are running over time. Thank you very much for this very nice session. Uh, Rahul uh, Bhargav, may I invite you to please give away the mementos, please? <coughs> So, uh, Raghu, thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Millere, thank you. <laughs> Dr. Langhammer. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> One more? No, for Dr. Everett. Uh, I don't know, it's been a long afternoon and we've heard a lot of things, uh, bits and pieces and connecting the dots and all. But in the end, I think uh, we, uh, it, it's necessary to now think back and for this, uh, we have Mr. Ramu Ramanathan to give us a closing uh, session in which I hope he will be sharing some uh, takeaways and some insights as to what he has heard or what he may be thinking about. So, uh, Mr. Ramu Ramanathan, he's the editor of Print Week and uh, uh, he has been associated with the printing industry for over 30 years. In addition to that, he is a renowned playwright. His book, Three Sakina Manzil and Other Plays is a collection of eight Indian plays in English published by Orient Black Swan. His list of plays includes Cotton 56, Poly, Poly Setter 84, Polyester 84, yes, 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 written, and Jazz, and Comrade Kumkarna, Postcards from Bardoli. His other plays include Shanti Shanti, It's War, and um, Maha, Mahadevi Bhai, and uh, there's been, this has had more than 300 plus shows in schools, colleges and collaborators, which has been uh, broadcast by BBC. So I hand over to Mr. Ramu Ramanath. So thank you. I know we are way beyond time, so and it's about food safety. And in the interest of safety, I'll sort of ensure that I'll keep this really, really short. So two quick things. Uh, I don't have a PPT. Uh, the idea was to sort of scramble whatever it is that I collected over the afternoon and share that with you. Uh, I'm also going to keep this very simple and straightforward so that it doesn't really, you know, uh, sort of cause a little bit of malfunction. I'll share a short uh, film which I uh, enjoyed. This is again one of the joys of teaching. So I picked this up from a very young friend of mine and which I think epitomizes a lot of what we've been trying to say. So if we can have the, it's a short film which is actually made by a company which is trying to promote food apps. So you can see what they've done. <laughs> Change the world 
There's nothing to it available on uh, uh, YouTube and this is created by somebody called Fiona Apple so that's the sort of melody that you have uh, one of the reasons to share it was of course the fact that food is also fun you know sometimes I think we tend to forget that that it is something that we tremendously enjoy and thank God that we sleep for eight hours in a day otherwise we would be eating one more lot of you know during the night cycle as well the other reason to share this was also you know some of the um, uh, concern that we have with social media and what is happening in that particular world. This is a f very, very good example of a counter media strategy. And this is again something as a printing and packaging industry, I think we need to sort of uh, take something from. Um, I, I think sometimes we tend to get a bit reactive about what we are boasting and shouting about and that sort of came up a couple of times today. Uh, there's something called hoax slayer. I don't know if you've heard about this. As you know, in the last few years, we have something uh, in India which is called fake news. So this is actually a very young guy of about 23, 24. He's got a cell of about two people. And his main objective in life is to ensure that news multiplies. So for example, you know, you have something like Tolleen Free. This is the kind of news that hoax layer would pick up and multiply. These are people typically small groups with Twitter following of 50,000, 2 lakhs, 3 lakhs, and they are the guys who create the next set of news. This is something I think as an industry we need to, I think, be a little proactive about how we push ourselves out there as in terms of profiling. This is of course a very overstated Hollywood way of doing it, but there's also subtle guerrilla ways of doing it. In 1952 or 53, when you know London banned the coal fire, and if you recall the old films about London, where the you know the fire is emanating, and it was the most polluted city. If you read your Charles Dickens, the fact that it sort of became the biggest news was because Fleet Street was given that information in advance. They pushed that you know bit of information, and that's how it got multiplied, and the citizens realized. And it was then that subsequent cities around the world decided to sort of do away with that. This is something as a strategy, which is a possibility that as an industry. It's something I've felt when, you know, the GST presentations were going on over the last one month, that the governments, the regulatory authorities are very unfamiliar with our industry. It's also the beast of what our industry is. It's fragmented. There are different voices. It's multiple. We don't have one state of regulation. But this is the way to sort of counter sort of some of that myth. I think Hoaxlayer is a model that we have. This is a model that we have, and that was one of the reasons to kind of share. The other reason is also when Ashish had called and, you know, uh, and sort of said that this is what we are planning to do. At that particular point of time, I was uh, driving around in South Gujarat. Um, and as some of you might be aware, it's the sort of food basket of India in terms of just the sheer fertility of soil. And a lot is happening in that particular area. And it so happened quite coincidentally that I was in a place called Bardoli. Um, and, you know, today we are on August 4th. 
on August 8, 1928 was the Bardoli Satyagraha. And one of the mandates of that was again food. And uh, you know, as human beings, we tend to sort of operate like historians and I, we got a sense of that even today, where every time we are talking of something, we tend to reflect into the past. Uh, for those of you not familiar, I'll just uh, sort of, I'll come to what he said because I think it's also crucial and in a, in a sense it's, it's amazing that something that he had written in 1928 is actually applicable to us today while we are seated here in sort of the 21st century. So Bardoli, for those of you who don't know, um, uh, was a satyagra in the uh, uh, southern part of Gujarat. Uh, so Gandhiji is uh, in a way delegated Sardar Patel, he goes there and he works there for the peasants and mainly there's an agrarian revolution and they are sort of fighting for those kind of causes. Uh, thankfully, there's a small little booklet about that which is written by Mahadev Desai who was very briefly Gandhi's secretary from 1919 to 1942. And what I've done is I've just very sort of in a very uh, WhatsApp kind of way extrapolated some of what Vallabhai Patel says during the... and it's in a way sums up what today's sessions were about. So one is he says, and he says seven things, he says no one should die of starvation in independent India. Remember he's saying this in uh, 1928, 8th of August. Uh, no one should die of starvation in, in, uh, in independent India. What India grows is for everyone. Then he says that our leaders should not use an alien language rules, taxations which the common people do not understand. Nor should there be rules or taxes unjustifiably incurred. Fourth, he says, of course this is in the context of the British Empire, but he says India's military expenditure should not be heavier than that of food. Then he says people who create our food, all of us who are food makers and we are part of this whole eco chain, we should not be subjugated because we are crucial to what happens next because India needs food. That seems to be his main this thing. Uh, the sixth point that he says is that people who work in food should pay heed that the best paid op official should not earn a great deal more than its lowest servants because after all we are all food soldiers. And then finally he says food should be neither costly nor difficult to have access to. These are broadly the seven points that he says which are sort of extrapolated out of a long struggle that they had on the ground. Uh, now the interesting thing is that why is this important is today, I mean again some stats that we've picked up from the Swaminathan uh, report and I think again it's crucial to share because when we talk of things like um, <coughs> food safety, we talk of things like preservation of our food items, I think we are also looking at food not just as a commodity but we are looking at food as human rights. So one of the things that the Swaminathan uh, report has sort of said is that we have about 1.5 million hectares of irrigable land in India which is, uh, you know, cultivated for food grains. Out of that 86% is about the small farmers. And last year we did, uh, uh, we cultivated about 260 million tons of grains. And in spite of the food production yields increasing, in spite of the meat yields increasing, in spite of all the fishery yields in, uh, increasing, the amount of food that India needs is going to double by 2022. Uh, are we going to be food deficit by then? Because as you've realized, one of the biggest crises we've had in the 20th century has been that thanks to or due to industrialization, China, India and a few of the sub-Saharan states, these are the only ones which are actually still irrigable uh, agrarian economies. The rest of them have, in a sense, they're not part of this whole thing. So one of the main concerns that we have is, uh, is this. Um, I'll come just quickly, I'll just try to keep this very short again, uh, to specific uh, points about today's uh, uh, conclave and seminar. Um, so two or three things. One is, of course, it's extremely good that we've had this seminar and one of the, uh, you know, heartening trends that we are seeing over the last six months, 12, uh, you know, to 12 months is that there's been an increasing vocalization of people in this space. Earlier it used to be guarded, but now we find that more and more organizations, and I'm specifically talking of, uh, you know, since I edit a printing magazine, it's mainly to do with printers, converters, uh, people as part of that ecosystem. So again, when we hosted, I think, two webinars over the last six months, we found that A, 
the participation in terms of people making presentations was uh, a the knowledge sharing and the level of knowledge sharing was phenomenal but what was even more interesting was the sheer participation of the industry voices from across india so typically 200 people 300 people coming similar to, to akin to today more and more people a are wanting to be part of this conversation number one number two is that not only are they wanting to be part of this conversation they want to know how to do this and I think the best way, of course, seems to be case studies because it's obviously going to be the unique Indian way of doing this which will ultimately, you know, shine through. Because we have our own sort of peculiar problems of, you know, costing, we have our own peculiar habits of, you know, cultural traits, habits, etc. So how are we going to do it? What was also heartening about today and, of course, some of these other forums where these things are happening is that one is that it is no longer confined only to the top of the pyramid. Once upon a time, we found that the knowledge quotient was always there at the top. Now we find that there is a general trickle down A, which I think is wonderful in terms of you know just our entire industry. The second thing is it's not just only the 1,000, 1,500 crore companies. And again, I'm talking only of the printers, you know, typically your newspaper plants, your book printers, or even your, um, uh, you know, label converters or packaging converters. But it's also the small SMEs who are now understanding how to, in their small space, be able to be uh, sustainable economically and uh, environmentally viable and of course create products which in the long term benefit society. So I think this is something that is happening overall and uh, you know it's phenomenal one of the persons who shared and it's of course not got much to do with books but again it's just he's a book printer in Shivakasi and you realize the extent to it's a 26 acre plant he's got wind turbines he's got solar energy etc and the manner in which he's sort of ensuring that there is a certain level of conservation. Uh, I'll just quickly, uh, a few of the points that uh, uh, that came up today and I'll just quickly touch upon them in just the interest of time. So I've again made copious notes, but I think what I'll do is put them all on mail and sort of share it so that then we can all, you know, probably discuss on it. Uh, the increasing focus by government bodies, I think that's generally a good thing. I, and I, you know, during the coffee break, I think uh, generally that was getting resonated that that, that was a, is, is positive. And as uh, you know, Mr. Singh of Tetra Pak mentioned that it's less adversarial and more advisorial, which I think again is healthy. That there is a conversation, and you know, the government bodies are sort of talking to us, the experts, the specialists, the scientists. Um, the, the downside of it is we need to find better ways to disseminate that info. So FSSAI, if you go to the website, e extraordinary, but there has to be a better methodology in terms of how to get that information across to the f final customer. The second thing, again, there were a few converter friends who were in the audience and they said, you know, I asked them how were they feeling about the whole session. They said that extremely good, but this is what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. This is something that we are combating on a day-to-day -day basis. And their main concern was, yes, we do work to create and develop solutions. We do push the brands, but ultimately there's a cost for everything. And somewhere, unfairly, the, you know, the cost component is uh, sort of put onto the heads of the uh, converters, especially in these tough times. Uh, then, of course, I think the point that you made that we have this bewildering array of ordinances, regulations, rules. It's almost impossible because you're all there are, I think, at the last count, someone mentioned 162 or 165 of these rules and regulations. It, is it possible to sort of standardize some of that? Um, then again, I think, uh, you know, Mr. Uh, Anil Kumar, uh, he spoke of the fact that the constitution and they're going to set up a bench and a committee which will, uh, again, which will be comprising of food authority, scientific committees and scientific panels. And that within 30 days, uh, there will be a process of sort of, uh, you know, uh, getting feedback from the industry and including stakeholders like us. Uh, again, you know, there are a few questions and those are specifically directed for him. So I'll, I think I'll skip that because mainly to do with how they're going to do the monitoring, uh, what are going to be the comparative checks with regard to the international guidelines, what kind of systems are there to monitor, etc. And what is the possibility in terms of a larger game plan? I mean, in terms of sort of creating things like food cities and so on. Uh, the fourth thing, which again, I think a lot of, you know, when we, we one of these forums we had, I think, uh, ITC and Tetra Pak, and of course, as you know, most of them have uh, uh, independent uh, laboratories and testing facilities within the organization, within their uh, of factories. And one of the questions that had, you know, repeatedly comes up is, 
uh, autonomous bodies which should help us make lab laboratories available for testing the products for migration and conformance to ordinance. So I was very happy to see your, I think, your second last or last slide where you sort of bring this up in terms of, a, I think, a, a viable, but again, to make that uh, available because currently I think there are long lead times when people go and approach, uh, you know, typical example, Indian Institute of Packaging, you send a sample, by the time it sort of comes back, it takes a hell of a long time. So it's, it acts as a deterrent. Uh, and it's also unwelcoming for people who are willing to adhere. Uh, again, whether this should be a government initiative, industry initiative, or a sort of conglomerate of that. Uh, the other thing is, again, current infrastructure. So top quality packaging on the one, and I think it came up three or four times. I think Venki referred to it, uh, the, the gentleman, uh, the last speaker referred to it. Uh, and, you know, that's again uh, absolutely bewildering. Uh, yesterday I flew in uh, from um, um, Bombay to Delhi and the, the gentleman on my right was somebody from LIC, Life Insurance Corporation. And I said, oh, you know, we just got chatting and I said, you're probably the largest uh, employee of people in this country today. And he said, no, not really. So he's, I asked him, so who do you think is? He said, all these food guys. So I said, in what way? He said, look at the number of, you know, food delivery, food pizza delivery guys. And you started, I mean, of course, one mentally started calculating. Today in the US, I mean, this happened about uh, 40 years ago, where McDonald's, you see, overtakes Ford as the single largest, uh, you know, employee of people. And I think the same thing is happening. But the question then is, if you look at the boys and girls, and I mean, they're, you know, well-meaning, etc. But ultimately, the pizza box, or the food takeaway that is coming to your house is being handled manually by a lot of these children who are absolutely untrained. So on the one hand, we have these sort of extremely stringent rules and regulations, and none of it is trickling down at this particular level. This manhandling of products and, for example, paper cups, you know, I'm Venki again mentioned something to the effect of 25 billion cups being produced and consumed by India today. What is happening with those cups? I mean, a good example is at the airports, the way the cups are handed out to you. So the handling of that. Again, something that came up was, you know, simple apps like uh, sort of pa uh, safety packaging calculators to test these things live and on hand, migrations, emissions, toxicology. I think this can be made into a kind of an instant feedback system. So it also helps A, uh, maintain, uh, you know, uh, transparency and also incentivize this whole process. Um, among other things, I'm sort of severely diabetic, I'm a heart patient, I consume a lot of medicine and I probably about 30 to 32 tablets in a day and I realize the sheer horror in which one has to sort of consume it because there is always the chance and scope of human error and the way the, you know, the, the, the various kind of medication pills are being sort of packaged it is completely unhelpful because there is no way a, to measure counterfeit, there's no way to uh, you know, measure the expiry dates. So all these things, again, from consumer perspective, this kind of thing is, uh, uh, is difficult. So it's safeguarding of packaging, especially from the point of view of measures in pharma. And uh, yeah, I think that's broadly it from my side. Um, for me, I mean, uh, I'll, I'll just sort of end with this. I, I think uh, uh, two or three months uh, uh, ago, uh, one was at the Sigwork factory and for me that visit was a kind of an eye-opener and I sort of want to reinstate that also because I think it's befitting that you've A, taken the effort of organizing something so huge and having all the captains of the industry to get this conversation going. One is if we can probably take it out into the larger space. So there were really three reasons. It was A, I remember an extremely hot day when one was at the Siegwork factory, but one of the things that happened was uh, the Siegwork top management, uh, I think very sweetly served food to every employee in the, so I remember uh, Mahesh, Ashish, uh, as well as Anoop and everybody. And uh, so I, that was, I think, sort of a, a wonderful way to sort of, you know, acknowledge the contribution of your fellow. The other thing is that which impressed me was the, the scientific methods and systems that they had in their own factory. Uh, and, you know, in a way, we have always, whenever one has visited an ink factory, always been taught at some level that, you know, this is a commodity, it is always being pushed, it's just a very low proportion. But the fact that there is a thought being given to it and a fine kind of, you know, availability of scientific core knowledge in India, which is available to us as an industry, I think that for me was a big, big eye opener. And the fact that the team was a young team and, you know, they were willing to share that kind of information. 
And the third thing, which I think is part of the, the sort of SIG work management, and I think that is something we, I, for me, again, was a great learning experience, and today reinforced that, was that, you know, ink A is not a commodity, ink is something that is val to be valued, and I think something, that same lesson we can sort of extend to food, that food is A, not a commodity, it is something to be valued, and in India particularly, it's something that every, every you know, human being, every child, every woman sort of needs that. And I think for me, that was a big lesson, that, which is why we need this level of conversation with this, and at a much more heightened level, so that more and more people know about this. That's all I have to share. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ramnathan. Very lively and effervescent <laughs> delivery of, of uh, what all we can think about as a consequence of this. So to thank you, I call upon Ashish to hand over a memento. And, and Ashish would like to say a few words. Just a big thank you for all those who stayed back till the end and uh, really good to have you here. I hope it was uh, enlightening and, uh, and interactive. So uh, thank you very much and let's uh, head out for the uh, cocktails and dinner. Thanks. Thanks very much.